Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton faced off in the first of three presidential debates in the U.S. Who came out ahead? CNBC senior contributor Larry Kudlow will give us his take. And how could the November election remake the Supreme Court? Candidate for U.S. Senate in New York and judicial expert Wendy Long will explain. And finally, does baby make four? The DNA of three people led to the birth of a child this week. We'll discuss the implications with bioethicist Father Tad Paholchik. The World Over Live begins right now. Now, from Washington, D.C., Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. Larry Kudlow, Wendy Long, and Father Tad Paholchik are all straight ahead. If you'd like to comment on tonight's show or if you have a question, I'll be live tweeting throughout. You can find me on Twitter at Raymond Arroyo, or you can email me at worldover at EWTN.com. But here's the brief news from the world over this week. The first presidential debate between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump is in the books. The showdown was the most watched presidential debate ever, with 84 million viewers. Among the highlights, Clinton emphatically denounced Trump for not releasing his personal tax returns, suggesting that he's hiding something. And Trump repeatedly cast Clinton as a typical politician, as he sought to capitalize on Americans' frustration with Washington. Most pundits thought Clinton had the edge over Trump, but many online polls suggested that Trump won the debate. Ultimately, those undecided voters will have the last word. Solutions right now. For 30 years you've been doing it, and now you're just starting to think of solutions. Well, actually, I will bring, excuse me, I will bring back jobs. You can't bring back jobs. Well, actually, um, I have thought about this quite a bit. Yeah, for 30 and years. I have, uh, well, not quite that long. Uh, I think my husband did a pretty good job in the 1990s. I think a lot about what worked and how we can make it work again. Well, he approved NAFTA. million new jobs, he approved a NAFTA, balanced budget. Which is the single and worst trade deal comes, ever approved in this country. More on the debate and what the candidates said about their economic plans in our next segment with Larry Kudlow. And Congress voted to override President Obama's veto of a bill that would allow families of 9-11 victims to sue Saudi Arabia for allegedly backing the hijackers. The vote was overwhelming, 97 to 1 in the Senate, while the House of Representatives voted 349 to 77. It was the first time an Obama veto has been overridden. The president called the move by Congress a mistake that set a dangerous precedent. Is that if we eliminate this notion of sovereign immunity, then our men and women in uniform around the world could potentially start seeing ourselves subject to reciprocal laws. Supporters of the override called it necessary to give 9-11 families the chance to seek justice against foreign sponsors of terror. The lone vote in the Senate against the override was Minority Leader Harry Reid. Democratic candidate for Vice President Tim Kaine and Senator Bernie Sanders were no-shows for the vote. And tensions are escalating in Syria as the battle for Aleppo continues. On Wednesday, U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry warned his Russian counterpart, Sergei Lavrov, that Washington will cut off all contact with Russia if Russian and Syrian government forces continue to attack rebel-held parts of Aleppo. According to the U.N., more than 200 people have been killed there, including more than 100 children. Russian media reports that at least 20 churches in the area have been destroyed by rebel forces. Aleppo Bishop Antoine Audo told the Associated Press that the situation in Syria has forced more than half of the Christians to leave and that dialogue is needed to end the bloodshed. And this is uh, a very bad, uh, bad situation uh, for us, for everybody, for all uh, Syrian and for uh, the church uh, in particular. The solution is not uh, in the military solution. The solution is political. 
and uh, for us uh, as a Syrian political solution and coming from inside Syria with the support of the United States helping uh, to, to catch. On Thursday, Pope Francis lamented the continued plight of Christians in Syria and elsewhere. He offered his thoughts to those who suffer the consequences of violence and look to the future with fear in the midst of so much darkness. The latest bombardment has been some of the worst in Syria's five-year civil war, and it comes after the failure of a short-lived ceasefire brokered by the U.S. and Russia earlier this month. And this week saw the passing of former Israeli President Shimon Peres. The Nobel Peace Prize winner was 93 when he died on Wednesday, two weeks after suffering a major stroke. Perez, who as foreign minister led Israel into peace talks with the Palestinians in the mid-1990s, was celebrated as a peacemaking visionary abroad, but was a controversial figure in his own country. As Foreign Minister Perez secretly brokered the historic Oslo Interim Peace Accords with the Palestinians, signed at the White House in 1993. For his efforts, he shared the 1994 Nobel Prize with Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin and Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat. A career statesman, Perez ran five times for Prime Minister, never winning the office. His only election victory came in 2007 when the parliament chose him as president, a largely ceremonial position. May he rest in peace. And the Vatican has told the UN that its controversial sustainable development goals must be based on authentic and absolute respect for life. The remarks were made by Vatican Secretary of State Cardinal Pietro Parolin speaking this past week at the UN General Assembly. He noted that while the Sustainable Development Goals seek to end poverty, protect the environment, and promote well-being and prosperity, they also include language calling for universal access to sexual and reproductive health care, code words, Paroline suggested, for contraception and abortion. And some 400,000 people filled the streets of Mexico City on Saturday in protest against the government's attempt to redefine marriage. President Enrique Peña Nieto supports legalizing same-sex marriage and adoption across the country. Led by the National Front of, for the Family Party, it was one of the largest demonstrations seen in Mexico in years. On Sunday, Pope Francis lent his support to the protesters who are, quote, in favor of family and life, which in these times require special pastoral and cultural attention around the world. End quote. Same-sex marriage is legal in the capital, Mexico City, and nine of Mexico's 31 states. In June of last year, the country's high court ruled that it was unconstitutional for Mexican states to bar gay marriages. Mexican bishops have strongly opposed the measures. And three cardinals are among the thousands who have signed a declaration affirming the church's teaching on marriage. This in response to what signatories claim are widespread errors about the true meaning of marriage, particularly following the Synod on the Family and the publication of the Pope's exhortation, Amoris Laetitia, titled Declaration of Fidelity to the Church's Unchangeable Teaching on Marriage and to Her Uninterrupted Discipline. It's such a catchy title. The document <laughs> states that there is an urgent moral duty to reaffirm the immemorial teachings of the Catholic Magisterium on family and marriage. To that end, it reiterates the Church's teaching on chastity, marriage cohabitation, same-sex unions, civil remarriage after divorce, the state of grace and state of sin, as well as the sacraments of reconciliation and the Eucharist. Cardinals Raymond Burke, Carlo Cafara, and Janis Pujats are among the Church leaders who signed the document. And on the bioethics front, the birth of a child conceived with the DNA of three people was announced this week. The baby boy was born in April following a new and controversial method utilizing DNA from two women and one man. A team of U.S. doctors performed the procedure in Mexico for a Jordanian couple in an attempt to bypass a genetic disorder carried by the mother. The new procedure is one that closely resembles cloning, also called nuclear cell transfer. 
The process is banned in the U.S., but embryologists are hailing it as a giant step in correcting flaws in parents' DNA. Critics question the safety of the procedure, as well as the ethical concerns that arise from tinkering with human embryos. More on all of this later in the show. And for the first time in centuries, an ancient biblical scroll can be read thanks to computer scanning technology. The scroll discovered in a dig at a synagogue near the Dead Sea city of En Gedi in 1970 is believed to be from the first century. The scroll was badly burned and thought too brittle to open. The feat of recovering the text was made possible by software programs developed by W. Brent Seals at the University of Kentucky. Using cross scans of the unraveled scroll, the software was able to reconstruct a clear text from damaged and otherwise unreadable material. The scroll's content? Two chapters of the Book of Leviticus. It is hoped that the new computer technique could reveal the contents of other unreadable scrolls, including some of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And last week I told you of the first ever Olive Mass, a national gathering to honor those in the food and hospitality industry to be held in New Orleans. The Table Foundation, founded by Father Leo Patalinghug, who hosts a program on EWTN, organized the Olive Mass at the St. Louis Cathedral in beautiful Jackson Square. The idea was to pray for chefs and all of those in the hospitality industry who in their own special way spread the gospel through their work. Well, the mass went off and New Orleans Archbishop Gregory Amon has offered to host it again next year. And finally, two amazing events to tell you about. For those of you in the New York area, if you or your children love the number one New York Times best-selling book, Wonder, I'm hosting a very special live story-ended conversation this Sunday, October 2nd, with author R.J. Palacio. She'll join me at the Sheen Center for an amazing conversation and book signing. Don't miss this very special event. For tickets, go to sheencenter.org for all the details, and we may even take some of your questions. I'm also hosting a live conversation with my pal Mel Gibson in Orange County on October 20th at the Freed Theater on the Christ Cathedral Campus. We'll be discussing Mel's career, his new movie, Hacksaw Ridge. Tickets are very limited. I posted a link on my Facebook and Twitter pages. Go to RaymondArroyo.com for more info on both of these events. When we return, we'll analyze the first presidential debate with Larry Kudlow. Should Trump release his tax returns? And where were the social issues? The World Over Live continues in a moment. Stay right there. I just left Detroit and I just left Philadelphia and I just, you know, you've seen me. I've been all over the place. Uh, you decided to stay home and that's okay. I think Donald just criticized me for preparing for this debate. And yes, I did. And you know what else I prepared for? I prepared to be president. And I think that's a good thing. Those were the presidential candidates, Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, during Monday's first presidential debate. So how did the candidates do? And were ab either of them able to reach beyond their base? Joining us to discuss this and to give us his thoughts on the important economic issues at play in the race is CNBC senior contributor, radio host, and author of the new book, JFK and the Reagan Revolution, A Secret History of American Prosperity. Would you welcome Larry Kudlow back to the program? Larry, thanks for being with us. Thank you, Raymond. Appreciate it very much. So you heard that opening there. Um, it seemed Hillary was really prepared to go into this debate. She had every line. She had everything gamed out. Do you think Donald Trump prepared for this debate or prepared properly? Well, I don't know. I mean, I was not in the inner group that doing the prep. Uh, very few people were. So I, I just can't tell. From, but first of all, you can't underestimate Hillary Clinton. She's a very smart woman. She did have her lines in tow, mm -hmm. and um, that showed in the, in the debate. Probably 
maybe she won on points. I don't know whether it's going to move the uh, polling needle or not. You know, I thought Donald Trump did pretty well at the beginning. Yeah, certainly the first half hour, he was talking about the economy. And he was using uh, his tax cut plan and his regulation cut plan uh, to show that economic growth. He mentioned Ronald Reagan. So Trump established the high ground on that. I would have liked him to have hammered it more as the debate went on. You know, the Cudlow rule of debating down through the years, it really doesn't matter what you ask me. It's what I want to tell you that matters. And I think Mr. Trump needs to master that. And I wish he had mentioned Obamacare. Uh, the economy is the number one issue in this country by a wide margin. Mm. Obamacare and terrorism are two and three. I wish he had pounded her on Obamacare because it's very unpopular and it's wrong. She wants to nationalize health care. Lara, you mentioned it a moment ago. The debate began with questions about the economy. Here is what Clinton had to say about Trump's tax plan, a tax plan that you have been consulting with him on. Watch this. And the kind of plan that Donald has put forth would be trickle-down economics all over again. In fact, it would be the most extreme version, the biggest tax cuts for uh, the top percent of the people in this country that we've ever had. I call it trumped up trickle-down. Larry Kudlow, your reaction to that? Does that work? Is that Well, effective? I just think it... No, I don't. I think it's sheer nonsense. However... I think Mr. Trump should have rebutted that. He, he didn't say anything after she said that. And I think that was a big debater's mistake. The mm -hmm. fact of the matter is, Trump does have the largest business tax cuts in probably in history, certainly as long as I remember, and I've been mm -hmm. in the game a long time. He's going to cut 15 percent from 40. Now, that's for large C corps and small businesses, so-called S-Corps. Mm -hmm. So that is not for rich corporations. That is for everybody. Study after study has shown that the best way to raise worker wage earning, the best way for the middle class, is to slash the business tax rate and create incentives for companies to stay home, create incentives for them to start new businesses with investors, create incentives for people to move their money back to the United States from offshore. That's all part of Trump's plan. And when you look at the distribution uh, of his tax cuts, actually, the middle does very well. In fact, the whole, it's pretty evenly distributed, a little bit favorable to the top, but they have more money. But basically, I mean, he increases the standard deduction to $30,000. Uh, you know, that's a terrific thing for lower and uh, middle income people. So he mm -hmm. had plenty of ammunition to attack her back. He just didn't quite get it out. That was the problem. Mm -hmm. Larry Kudlow, in your book, uh, JFK and the Reagan Revolution, you make the case there that it was JFK who first coined cutting taxes to try to revive an economy and that Reagan actually took up the torch from JFK. Walk us through a little of that. And is that what Trump is proposing here? Well, listen, JFK wanted 5% economic growth. And he mm. believed that if he didn't get it, he'd lose the election in 1964. Mm. Eisenhower years were not great years. There were three recessions. So Kennedy right. wanted something. He listened to his liberal academic advisors, more government spending. That's what they did in 1961. It did not work. Republican Treasury Secretary Douglas Dillon came to JFK with a different approach, across-the-board reductions in marginal tax rates, along with loophole closers to rejuvenate the economy. Kennedy did it, and it worked. From 62 to 69, we had about 5% growth a year. Turn the clock forward, Ronald Reagan sees a terrible economy, inherits a terrible economy, high unemployment, high inflation. What does he do? He borrows Kennedy's tax cut plan. Uh, Jack Kemp was the guy that put it all together. Mm -hmm. And Reagan acknowledged time and again, in speech after speech and on national television, that he was borrowing from JFK's successful tax mm. cut plan, and it worked. And I think that was so gracious of him. Uh, by the way, a lot of Democrats liked the fact that Reagan liked JFK. That helped him politically. And both of those fellows were good persuaders 
in their speeches mm -hmm. and in their uh, written work, they persuaded you why these are good things. Now, your final point, Trump is very much in that tradition of JFK and Reagan on, uh, on tax cuts, and he will, therefore, if it ever went through, he will get a big, big growth uh, bang uh, out of that. You just got to, I think, be a little more persuasive uh, mm -hmm. to people sitting on the fence. Now, according to analysis of the Trump plan, it would cut $4 trillion from the federal revenues without cutting Medicare, Medicaid, or government services. How is that possible, Larry, that you can balance the budget out with those kinds of uh, uh, plans on the table? Well, a couple things. Um, you know, these... These estimates are all over the place. Um, the Tax Foundation, which I like the best because it has uh, dynamic scoring, uh, changing economic uh, behavior because of lower tax rates, they're at $3 trillion. Um, I think eventually we'll probably settle around $1 to $2 trillion, and the rest will be made up by budget cuts. Um, there will be large spending reductions uh, outside of the major entitlements, probably will include minor entitlements. There's a lot of waste, fraud, and abuse in the federal government, for heaven's sakes. I mean, basically, think of it this way. According to the Congressional Budget Office, over the next uh, 10 years, tax revenues are going to go up by so something like $49 trillion. Hmm. And the Trump plan would have tax revenues going up by about $47 trillion. Now, don't you think $49 trillion is enough? I mean, how much can you go? You see, Trump's not cutting the level of revenues. He's cutting the rate of growth of revenues. It's like spending. You don't have actual spending cuts or rare cases. You're just slowing down the growth of it. That's all he's doing. These estimates but are is, vastly but, overrated. But Larry, what isn't matters it, are economic growth incentives. That's but isn't it time to really cut something of the spending? I mean, Congress does this all the time with the sequester cuts. All they were doing is lowering the rate of increase from year to year. That's not a cut where I live or in my house. Isn't it time for real well, actually, cuts? Uh, it, it, it's always time for real cuts, according to Larry Kudlow. Uh, I'm pretty much of a budget hawk outside of the military. But actually, the sequester bill, which I think was 2011, something yeah. like that, late 2010, that actually did cut into the level of a number of programs. They actually did that. Not all, to be sure, mm -hmm. but they actually did that. I mean, eventually, you're going to have to reform the health care system, particularly the yep. Medicare system. I'm not so worried about Social Security. If you have 4 or 5% growth, that'll be fine. But you're going to have to take care of Medicaid and Medicare, probably push as much as you can to the states uh, and let them uh, set their own priorities. But again, grow the economy. Economic growth will eliminate the yearly budget deficits, mm -hmm. and economic growth will shrink the uh, uh, budget debt as a share of GDP by substantial amounts. The key is growth. America mm -hmm. is in a cranky, pessimistic mood. You know why? Mm -hmm. We haven't really grown in 15 years, wow. and it's time to turn that around. Mm -hmm. Trump's got a good plan. He's just got to get it out, I think, a little more and uh, be a little more persuasive, and he'll be fine. I have to play this for you. This is Hillary Clinton going after Donald Trump on the release of his tax returns. I want you to handicap what happened here. Watch. Why won't he release his tax returns? Maybe he doesn't want the American people, all of you watching tonight, to know that he's paid nothing in federal taxes. That makes if me smart. If he's paid zero. I will release my tax returns against my lawyer's wishes. When she releases her 33,000 emails that have been deleted. Larry Kudlow, how does that play to a family just trying to make ends meet? Was that the right approach, the right answer? Well, look, uh, I wouldn't have put it that way myself, but I'm not Mr. Trump. What he's saying is any, anybody, in business or not, is going to try to have the lowest possible tax uh, uh, payment as they possibly can within the law, obviously. And I, I think that's what Trump is referring to. Uh, I, I think this is much to do about staff, nothing. I thought his uh, rejoinder, Can you, you uh, tell us where the 30,000 so emails are, I thought that was clever and kind of cute. I think this is an overrated service. issue. I think most Americans want to pay as little in taxes as they legally can. Mm -hmm. uh, should he release the tax returns, Larry? What's the prohibition? He claims he's, he's under audit. Is it time to just release those? Every candidate releases them eventually. Well, yes, but an awful lot of tax lawyers and accountants will tell you 
not to release before the audit is finished. It's not illegal to release, but they would warn you not to put that out. I think what Mr. Trump could do, and something that I would support, is give some sort of summary of his uh, tax returns. Mm -hmm. Hillary is just trying to make this case that he's hiding something. That's nonsense. Donald Trump is an honest businessman, and even with some setbacks, he has bounced back up and created a tremendous uh, real estate empire. And Mrs. Clinton, you know, should tell us all about the uh, pay-for-play speeches she and her husband have made and the people that went and saw her in the State Department and gave to the Clinton Foundation. I mean, that stuff, you know, you can go back and forth. Mm -hmm. Me, I still say this, Raymond, the biggest issue in this campaign is economic growth, wages and jobs, followed by terrorism, followed by health care reform. Mm -hmm. I don't think any of this other ankle biting is going to matter one whit. Were you, were you surprised that that never came up? Terrorism, the, the, the pressure cookers going off, people being stabbed in malls. That would seem to be top of the mind for Donald Trump. He never brought it up through this debate. Well, I think you're going to see much more of it in the next debate, which is going to focus, I think, much more on national security matters. Mm -hmm. I did, however, think Trump did very well in, uh, in answering and referring to the riots uh, in Charlotte and elsewhere, these horrible riots where people are getting killed. Because Trump has been all along a law and order candidate who country, is pro-cops. And there his argument is, you know, 99.5, well, 99.9% the, the cops are right and they're doing a great job. Mrs. Clinton has accused uh, 18,000 police departments around the country of being racist and having racist uh, uh, mm -hmm. sentiment, and she wants them to go through new training. I think she's on the wrong side of that issue. I think Trump is on the right side of that issue. Let's talk about NAFTA for a moment. Jobs moving overseas and jobs lost, as you mentioned. It's a big issue this campaign season. It came up during the debate. This is what Donald Trump had to say about NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement. NAFTA is the worst trade deal maybe ever signed anywhere, but certainly ever signed in this country. And now you want to approve Trans-Pacific Partnership. You were totally in favor of it. Then you heard what I was saying, how bad it is, and you said, I can't win that debate. But you know that if you did win, you would approve that, and that will be almost as bad as NAFTA. Nothing will ever well, top NAFTA. No, no. First of all, she did change her position. She did change her position she on did the indeed. Pacific trade deal. She did indeed. Okay. Um, because she was up against Bernie that. Sanders and had to come up with an answer. I mean, and he was so opposed to these well, trade deals. Right. I mean, look, I, let's face it. Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders are running a far-left Democratic Party. This is not the party of John F. Kennedy, for example. Mm -hmm. But putting all that aside, um, I don't agree with Mr. Trump that NAFTA was a terrible deal. I think there are issues in the deal, but I think NAFTA has actually done a, a lot of good. Now, there have been some people hurt. Some job losses, I don't uh, disagree with that. Mm -hmm. And I think things like job training and community colleges and tech schools are very important. However, one point I do agree with, Mr. Trump, American import, Mexican imports of American goods are taxed because Mexico has a value-added right. tax. All right. Uh, U.S. imports of Mexican goods are not taxed. Mm. And that does create an inequality at the border. And I think that point needs to be fixed. I think the trade taxation issue has to be mm -hmm. equalized. We've been discussing that quite a bit. A lot of people think the border adjustment is very, very important. So on that point, I agree wholeheartedly with Mr. Trump. You know, uh, like you, the, the Congressional Research Service, which is a nonpartisan research service here on Capitol Hill, they claim NAFTA did not cause the huge job losses feared by the critics, nor the large economic gains promised by supporters. The net overall effect on the U.S. economy is relatively modest. So does all this chatter about trade deals, does that, you think, excite the voter? Do they even understand what's at stake here? Well... I think it excites some voters. Mm -hmm. It doesn't show up in the top five or six issues, by the way, in polls. It doesn't. Mm -hmm. It excites some voters. And look, I, there, Mr. Trump is right to a, 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 some extent. It has probably cost us jobs in some areas, but it's also helped increase jobs in other areas. And I think the Congressional Research Service is about right. Net, net, net. Uh, it, it, there's really no, no huge gain, no huge loss. Let me just give you the Kudlow theory of free trade, Raymond. I know you're dying to hear this. Yeah, I've absolutely, I've been waiting for this, Larry. All right, here it is. I believe that Americans should have the freedom to buy the best quality goods 
at the lowest available prices anywhere around the world. That is what I believe, and I will always believe that. However, I will agree with Mr. Trump on one point. If you make a deal, you better keep that deal. And I will also mm. agree with him with respect to China, because China lies, cheats, and steals on almost everything. Mm. Uh, they break all the trade laws. They steal our intellectual property rights. And all that has to be fixed. So you make a deal, you got to keep the deal. Mm. On the other hand, I don't want America. We, we have a 1.5% average tariff, OK? Uh, that's, I believe, the lowest by far of any country in the world, certainly any developed country. I think that's freedom. I think that's choice, and I think that's healthy. Okay, I got to get into this other part of the debate. It is a major afterburn that we have been living through for the last few days. Hillary Clinton went after Trump on his treatment of women with this example. I want to play this for you, Larry, and get your reaction. One of the worst things he said was about a woman in a beauty contest. He called this woman Miss Piggy. Then he called her Miss Housekeeping because she was Latina. Donald, she has a name. Where did you find her? Her name Where is did Alicia you find this? Machado. Where did you find And this? she has become a U.S. citizen, and you can bet oh, really? she's going to vote okay. this November. Okay, good. Did Trump fall into a trap here, Larry Kudlow? This was clearly premeditated. The Clinton administration had been, or the Clinton campaign, had been sending pictures of Alicia Machado out for a good hour before the debate and videos of her. Why did he fall into this trap? Well, good question. Um, it's a question generically about women that Mr. Trump should have expected. Um, it's a question that Mrs. Clinton was very well rehearsed on, mm -hmm. like some of these other issues, you know, tax returns and so forth. Uh, he should have been ready for that. I, I think a lot of her strategy, Raymond, was she wanted to bait him, right. to bait him, and then get him to overreact and, and look, uh, you know, look badly in front of the uh, uh, world media. So mm -hmm. my feeling is she probably succeeded a bit on that question. On the whole, though, I think Trump had a good temperament in that debate. Um, he may have gone overboard on a few areas, but I think he was showed that he's a strong guy. And I think that's very important. You know, he's an outsider, number one. She's the quintessential insider. And uh, number two, He's a strong guy. I mean, I've always felt, I don't know the outcome of this election. My yeah. crystal ball is no better than anybody mm -hmm. else's. But I'm just saying, he has the potential to be a very strong leader of the United States and an agent for change. He has that great potential. I think a lot of voters find that attractive. I think Mr. Trump will have to probably, you know, state that perhaps right. more clearly uh, than he did in the first debate, in the next two debates. But I think that's part of his allure. Mrs. Clinton's been around for 30 years, that's true. Mm -hmm. Mr. Trump wants to shake up Washington. You know what? I do, too. I find that an attractive goal. Larry Kudlow, before I let you go, 84 million people plus were watching this debate. I always think this is an impressions game. It's not a one-shot deal. It's, little, it's like a mosaic these candidates are, are creating in the minds of the audience and, and the voters. My question is, we heard virtually nothing, in fact, nothing at all, on social issues, on the things that get the blood pumping of a faith-based audience and certainly your, your, your Catholic swing voters. Was that a mistake? And does that tamp down on their enthusiasm, do you think? Well, I, I think that's going to come up, Raymond. Mm -hmm. I think you're going to see that in one or both of the next two debates. Um, I think it could have been raised by Mr. Trump yeah. and some very key areas. Now, if I'm not mistaken, he did mention education reform, school choice, uh, and, and, and that's very positive. And he's had outreach to African-American uh, inner cities, which is a good thing. So I think he performed very well on that. Those are social issues and economic issues. His yeah. support of police and law and order, you know, that's a social issue. I think he did very well there. But I agree with you. I agree with you. You've got swing Catholic voters. By the way, that's one reason I wish he'd mentioned John F. Kennedy. Yeah. Um, maybe that's a small point, but it's out there. Um, I think that's coming. I think the social issues are coming. And I think both candidates are, you know, going to have to deal with that. And I, I really believe 
at least from my standpoint, as you know, I'm a conservative, uh, church-going Catholic. Mm -hmm. I really think that Trump's going to have the upper hand when we get into those social issues. Larry Kudlow, thank you for being here. The new book is JFK and the Reagan Revolution, A Secret History of American Prosperity. It's available at bookstores and online everywhere. Thanks again, Larry. Thank you, Raymond. Appreciate it very much. Up next, New York Senate candidate Wendy Long will talk about what the U.S. Supreme Court might look like depending upon who becomes president, and where is the Catholic voice, the guidance, leadership this election season? The World Over Live continues in a moment. Now, once again, Raymond Arroyo. The presidency isn't the only office being sought in November. U.S. House and Senate seats are also at stake. My next guest is running for U.S. Senate in New York against longtime Democratic Senator Chuck Schumer. She's a former Supreme Court clerk for Justice Clarence Thomas and a judicial expert. She joins me to discuss the current and future makeup of the U.S. Supreme Court, what it could look like soon, and where the Catholic leadership has been during this election season. Please welcome back to the program, Wendy Long. Wendy, thanks for being here. Raymond, it's great to be with you. We should say right away, we did invite Senator Schumer to appear on the program as well. Our request was not granted. Hmm. I want to start with a couple of bites. This will give both you as well as our viewers a sense of where these presidential candidates stand in regards to the life issue. Watch. As far as Planned Parenthood is concerned, I'm pro-life. I'm totally against abortion having to do with Planned Parenthood. I would defund it because of the abortion factor. We need to stand up for access to affordable contraception without interference from politicians or employers. And it is worth saying, again, defending women's health means defending access to abortion. Wendy Long, where have the Catholic voices, the, the bishops, been this election season? It seems like this issue is really on the back burner, even among Catholics. You don't hear anybody talking about it. What's happened this season? It, it does seem that way, Raymond, in terms of the church hierarchy, in terms of the media. But I'll tell you, during the 40 Days for Life, I go all around New York State. Mm -hmm. There are faithful people outside Planned Parenthood cl clinics praying, protesting peacefully. It's amazing. But mm -hmm. you don't hear anything about it. And if you go to the website of the Archdiocese of New York, you don't even see the abortion issue mentioned when it comes to the presidency in my race the, for the United mm -hmm. States Senate, the only other statewide race in New York besides the presidency. It's just not even mentioned. Uh, has the cardinal met with you, Cardinal Dolan? He has not. Sadly, so far, we've not been able to get a meeting with him. I've requested a meeting, mm -hmm. but we're, we're getting the feedback that he's not really interested in getting involved in politics. And so um, it's a little bit puzzling to me, and it's kind of sad, because I think, you know, one of the primary virtues that the church touts is dialogue. Mm -hmm. We want to have a dialogue. And also, I'm a convert to Catholicism, and I'm kind of all in this for what we believe, which I think is totally consistent with the U.S. Constitution. And we know that our opponents, Chuck Schumer and Hillary Clinton, are all in for Planned Parenthood and for abortion up until the moment of birth. Mm -hmm. And um, I just, I'm just really puzzled by why we can't even meet with the Cardinal. Now, uh, both Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump are invited to the Al Smith dinner this year. Now, this is the premier political slash Catholic event of the season. Happens in the middle of October, or late October, just before the election. Um, the predecessors of Cardinal Dolan, Cardinal Egan, Cardinal O'Connor, they refused to invite the presidential candidates to their Al Smith dinners because they thought it would give a platform to candidates opposed to church teaching, and they couldn't support that. Cardinal Dolan has decided last time he had President Obama attend, then candidate Obama, uh, and, and now he's having Hillary Clinton appear. Mm -hmm. uh, your thoughts on this as a pro-life Catholic candidate? Well, it's sad. And, you know, I ran also in 2012. I've never held public office, mm -hmm. but I felt so strongly about the wrong direction of our country that I was a citizen candidate four mm -hmm. years ago. 
I was told at that time there was no room for me at the Al Smith dinner, even though I was the only statewide candidate besides Mitt Romney on the ballot. But Chuck Schumer, your, your opponent, and Mayor de Blasio were the two featured speakers at last year's Al Smith dinner. I know. I don't really understand it. I can't explain it, Raymond, but, but I'm not in, I wasn't invited then, and I don't think I'm invited now. Um, I do think it, it pains me a little bit to see this. I mean, I, I know Cardinal Dolan believes in, in charity and, and in friendship, and, and we have to respect people with whom we disagree. Mm -hmm. But the disagreements that we have now with our political opponents go to the fundamental issues of human dignity and human life. And I fear that when we put those on what appears to be an equal plane, and we laugh and we make jokes, and it seems like everything's just fine, it would be one thing to break bread with people if you were very honest yeah. and you took the opportunity to point out the truth to them. But that's not what goes on at the Al Smith dinner. Yeah. No, it's, a, it's a, sort of surprising that, uh, you know, that this would go on. Mm. Because I, I know there was a lot of criticism last time and, and people, frankly, confused yes. by what the implication. Because years ago, the bishops made a rule among themselves and for themselves that those who were opposed to church teaching would not be given platforms or special honors in church events or church institutions. Now that rule has been broken all over the place. Exactly, and, and I th the thing is, I think that it's it's one to be to be charitable uh, and to to exhibit friendship to people with whom you disagree, mm -hmm. even on those fundamental issues. One thing, but to in some way equate them and mm -hmm. to put them up on a platform and imply that in some way their views are equal. Uh, which are very destructive of human dignity and human life, I think is a big problem because the church has a teaching function. The church in all of our great history has been a great teacher. It was a great teacher to me. It's what led me to the church as a convert. Let's talk for a moment about the makeup of the Supreme Court, where we stand now, where this court could go depending on who wins the presidency. Mm. Give me your sense. If Donald Trump wins, I mean, he's submitted a list of people who he would like to nominate to the Supreme mm -hmm. Court. What do you think of that list? Do you buy this idea of kind of parading out your list of potential Supreme Court Oh, picks? my gosh. I think it's incredibly brave and incredibly generous, Raymond. Nobody in the history of our country, no presidential nominee in the history of our country, has ever given those names in advance mm -hmm. for the people and said, judge me by whom I would nominate to the Supreme Court. It's always, ooh, it's a very tightly held secret and we don't want to expose them to any criticism. Yeah. He's letting it all hang out and saying, judge me by these people. This is who, who the mm -hmm. people I'd appoint. They're an amazing list of people. I clerked for Justice Clarence Thomas at the Supreme Court and I have to say, many of those on the list are former clerks of Justice Thomas. Those who aren't, I know, to be incredible judges who respect the Constitution, believe in judicial restraint. So I think this was a very brave and bold move on his part. Mm -hmm. and, and if Hillary Clinton wins the presidency, what, what role do you see, both on the federal, the appellate level, as well as uh, the Supreme Court? Well, we know absolutely that Hillary Clinton and Chuck Schumer's number one goal is to pack the Supreme Court and the federal appellate courts and the federal trial courts with as many left-wing, what they call progressives, who are liberal judicial activists who will just implement their Hillary Clinton and Chuck Schumer's political and social policies without regard to the Constitution. That is their goal because they know they don't have a majority of the American people behind them. This is the quick, mm -hmm. fast route to implementing all of their How social did we policies. get to this point, Wendy Long, where you have a, a such an ideological split? Justices should be fair-minded, blind uh, interpreters of the Constitution. Mm -hmm. How did we get to this point where we, we packed it with ideological servants rather than constitutional ones? Mm. Well, there was only one attempt prior when FDR tried to pack the court mm -hmm. for the New Deal. but. Really, this latest era began after JFK, who appointed Byron White, right. who was against Roe v. Wade. This latest era began really in the 70s, um, mm -hmm. and, and it was something about the, the liberals in this country decided they invented this thing called the living constitution. Right. And that means the constitution doesn't mean the words written on paper. It doesn't mean the principles the country was founded on. It means whatever a bunch of judges decide it should mean. And they can interpret it any way they want. And the way they want to interpret it is the way 
you know, the liberal intelligentsia, the academics, the editorial mm -hmm. page of the New York Times decide they want to interpret it. And it's just a, a piece of Play-Doh, really. Mm. Um, and there are no strictures on, on the Supreme Court under Before that. Before I let you go, you support term limits. Yes. Why? And you would hold yourself subject to term limits should you win this office uh, as Senator of New York. I feel strongly about that, Raymond. I think one of the biggest problems we have right now, and all of our other problems are traceable to this, is this professional political class that's entrenched itself in Washington. Mm -hmm. And I think the founders didn't write term limits into the Constitution because they could not foresee what we have now. Think about the founders. They pledged their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor. These were people of means, people of mm -hmm. learning, and they put it all on the table. Great risk, yeah. a great personal risk. And they said, we're risking it all for this country. It didn't enter their minds that their predecessors, the people who would fill their shoes, would do so essentially to climb a ladder of success, yeah, to make money, fame, be, right, mm -hmm. climbers. Yeah. But that's what we've got now. And so I think that's the reason that we need term limits. We One term or two? What should be the limit? What's the ideal for a senator? You've got a six years term. Honestly, I think one is great, but I'd be willing to go with two. I've pledged myself to two. Honestly, mm -hmm. I, I would love to go after one. And I think, you know, if George, if the one thing, remember Hamilton, the musical? Yeah. The great song about George Washington and how it was time to go. Yeah. If George Washington could walk away and say, you know what, you don't need me. There is not a single other person in this government that's so valuable that they can't walk away mm -hmm. and we can get somebody else. Wendy Long, thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Ray. And we taught him how to say goodbye. You Hamilton folks will know what we meant. Mm -hmm. uh, for more information on Wendy Long and her U.S. Senate run, visit wendylong.com. When we return, a baby conceived from the DNA of three separate individuals made headlines this week. Father Ted Baholchik is here to discuss the ethical implications and much more when the world over continues. Stay right there. Once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to The World Over. A new technique that incorporates the DNA of three individuals to conceive a child made headlines this week. But does this mean the child has three parents? Is this a new way to stamp out life-threatening disease or a moral Pandora's box with untold ethical concerns? Here to discuss is the Director of Education at the National Catholic Bioethics Center, neuroscientist, Father Tad Paholchik. Father Tad, welcome back to the Thank show. Thank you. Great to be with now, you. Now, uh, before I roll this little piece from CBS News that sort of explains the technique, what's actually happening in this case, is this even legal? This was a Dr. John Zhang. He's a New York-based physician. He performed this procedure abroad. It shouldn't would not he? be legal in the U.S. But, but what about his medical license? I mean, shouldn't that be at least up for review? I presume it might be, uh, but it depends because sometimes if you go and work in another country, if they have a different set of, you know, requirements and kind of licensing arrangements. You can do this. It, yeah, you can, you can kind of work outside the bounds. When mm -hmm. you work in Africa, you know, volunteer mm -hmm. physician with fewer resources, you'll have different expectations. I want to share this little piece. This is a CBS News report that aired this week, and it explains this new and very controversial procedure. Look. Scientists say this baby boy's birth is a medical breakthrough. Indeed, it's a revolutionary research. This is Dr. John Zhang holding the first baby conceived through a new in vitro fertilization technique that used the DNA of three people. The mother, whose name is being withheld, carries genes for a rare disorder called Lee syndrome. Dr. Zhang created embryos using the sperm of the father, the egg of the mother, and another egg from a donor. The goal, to switch out what's called the faulty mitochondrial DNA, which could pass on the disease. This mitochondrial DNA disease patient usually is a, a very uh, devastating situation for the babies and for the family. So the doctor would claim and supporters that you're actually straining out disease. You, you're perfecting humanity. You're preventing these horrible conditions. You would say what? Well, it's a powerful claim. It looks like that's what you're doing, but actually what you're doing is piecemeal assembling a new egg. 
out of several other starting sources. So it's not simply that you're curing something. And actually, the technique that you're using here, Raymond, it's interesting. It is called nuclear transfer. It's basically a type of cloning uh -huh. that's involved. And as you're moving these different pieces of the cell around and rebuilding the egg, um, you have really crossed into you know an, a new arena where potentially not just three, but maybe even more parents could be involved. But, but, but are we really talking about three parents here? I well, mean, in a sense, we are. I mean, we have three other individuals who are providing a genetic contribution. Now, granted, one of them is tiny. Yeah, one of them is like the, 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 the vessel, and then the other is putting the nucleus in that, in that egg, right? But then there's so, the mitochondria, which are these little batteries that mm -hmm. float around in the cell, and those are derived from a third person, the, the other woman. So her egg is the one that's cannibalized to get those. And those don't have defects, while the woman who was trying to get pregnant here in the beginning, she has problems with her little batteries. So what you are your ethical concerns watching this unfold? Well, there are a number of them. I mean, the issue here is first that we are transferring all of this into the laboratory. We're making procreation into manufacture. And we're doing this in a more radical way now. We're saying it, we're kind of doing eggs as Lego pieces, or mm. embryos as Lego pieces, where we start putting everything together, constructing our children, rather than receiving them as a mysterious gift in the marital embrace. And this is a fundamental transition. Yeah. It becomes very easy to then insist on quality control over your kids, manipulate them, freeze them, discard them, and we know that this goes on all the time so in fertility clinics. So this is really, it's, it's not only designer babies, it's really hybrid parenting, where That's you can correct. go beyond just two individuals of your choice. You could now extend this to be Four people, five people? Potentially, uh, in the future, they're going to likely go that direction. The actual technology that was used for this news report, you couldn't do more than three mm -hmm. uh, yet. But previous to this, you know, this news story got a lot of coverage. Everybody says, first time we've had three parents. Yeah. Wasn't the first time. Mm -hmm. We have had three parent embryos that were generated in the past by another technology called cytoplasmic transfer. Mm -hmm. And if you start messing with that technology and with this one, you could have more parents, four, five, maybe six. What are, the, what are the medical difficulties you foresee? I mean, they don't really know how this will transmute well, and grow in time. The right? other technique that I mentioned that they did with yeah. it prepared a number of, what, 30 children born this way. Huh. They followed up on some of them and they did see some diseases that they didn't know how to explain. And they said maybe it came from doing this. So there's always this law of unintended consequences. And we're facing that with this new technology as well, which is really a big, you know, reassembly of a woman's egg. Mm -hmm. And so to think that this is going to be done without any side effects. And remember when they did it, Raymond, they did five of these embryos that they produced. Only one grew. The other four didn't. So it's telling you, you know, this is pretty hard to do. You can expect complications. You can expect risks to a child that's going to be born this way. And I suspect the follow-up will probably have higher rates of birth defects mm -hmm. than what you see in normal in vitro fertilization. We're seeing some reportage about why women in big numbers are freezing their eggs. And this is happening in in vitro fertilization clinics all over the place. It is. What is the explanation? Why are they well, doing Well, you know, a lot of people in the past thought the reason a woman would do this is because, well, she wants to have a career first yeah, and go to, work. Know, delay, go to work, delay things. Mm -hmm. But they've done some follow-up studies on this, and it turns out that a lot of them are just convinced they have not found the right man to marry. So they're saying, I want to have a backup plan here. I'm going to freeze my eggs in case I don't find him soon enough to get married. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of an assurance policy, they think. Uh, that's what they're telling themselves. Maybe what they need to do is find Mr. Wright and clone him. Then we get <laughs> one of so many problems. Let's talk about this DC. Uh, actually, it's, it's coming up during Suicide Prevention Month. And the DC City Council is considering a bill that actually legalizes physician-assisted suicide. Tell us about it. Well, this is uh, an initiative not just here in D.C., but we're seeing this in other jurisdictions as well. After Brittany Maynard died in California, right. and California legalized physician-assisted suicide, there's been a fresh push to expand this. Now, I want to suggest to you, Raymond, that this is rooted largely and unfortunately in fear. People hear, oh, there's a lot of suffering here, yeah. you know, and they kind of recoil and they say, well, I want more options. Good medicine 
addresses those fears, but never by taking the life of the patient or offering options mm -hmm. for them to commit suicide. That's a failure of medicine. Mm -hmm. Rather, you turn to palliative care, hospice care, and we have an incredible armamentarium of tools to remediate and address pain and to deal with situations of suffering. What we need is a more supportive environment as people are dying so that they don't feel, hey, I'm in desperation. I have to, you know, turn to my doctor and ask him to become a killer. Well, it's strange this bill doesn't have any sort of mental uh, protocol where you, you do a mental review to see where this person is psychologically. Anyone suffering is going to, you know, you move into a different psychological place. That should be evaluated. You move you into think? a different uh, psychological place and also sometimes you have clear cases of clinical depression. Mm -hmm. And those have to be ruled out because a lot of times people who are depressed will say, oh, just let me go, let me die, I don't want to be around. And then when the depression lifts after you treat it with antidepressants mm -hmm. a week, two weeks later, yeah. they say, oh, no, no, I didn't really want to die. Hmm. So, you know, we have to be very, very careful in terms of just those safeguards. But the whole principle here of mm -hmm. sanctioning, I mean, that the bottom, uh, bottom line here is that what they're trying to do is to safeguard doctors. Because now, if a doctor were to do any of this, they would be sued and they would lose, mm -hmm. and they would lose their license. And now they're saying, you can go ahead and change the nature of what it is to be and a physician. And let's face it, insurance, and you won't be sued. insurance companies love this. The government loves it because it means less spending on the care of people at the end of life rather than hustling them to a quick it, end. It looks like that. I, mm -hmm. think, I think the insurance companies may be tempted by this as well. Father Tad Paholchik, thank you for being Great here for to your be with insight. You. For more on Father Tad's work and to read his commentary, you can visit National Catholic Bioethics Center's website at ncbcenter.org. Well, that is all the time we have. The show continues on Facebook and Twitter. Like me on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter. The links or at RaymondArroyo.com. Be sure to join us again next week. Until then, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, thanks for watching. I'm Raymond Arroyo from Washington, D.C. Bye now.